Uh, welcome. Uh, again, uh, let me extend my apologies for our technical issues last week. We certainly appreciate feedback uh, from this week's presentation. Uh, just if you have any comments, please uh, please let us know. So that said, I have a little bit of a different presentation I'm going to share with you today. Um, the presentation is really a preview of what you're going to see in the May special report. And the May special report um, is going to talk about how evolving money affects investing markets. So what you're going to see today is um, a little bit of review for those of you that are longtime participants uh, in the Headline Roundup webinar. Uh, and for those of you that have been longtime readers of the materials that we distribute. Uh, but it also it has been updated for where we are today. So it's interesting that evolving money creates particular predictable economic seasons and predicts um, or forecasts how investing markets will behave. So that's my topic for today. Uh, next week, we'll go back to a more traditional format. So this is again from the May special report. And I wanna to start today by talking about economic seasons. And as you see on the screen that, you know, you may think that this whole idea of economic seasons sounds a little bit crazy, but when you study history, these economic seasons have repeated themselves over and over again. And what I wanna talk about today is how they're closely tied to the money currency cycle. And each season, as you'll see, the severity of the season, the intensity of the economic season in which we find ourselves is affected by the currency system that's in place as the economic season changes. So admittedly, it's a bit of uh, maybe a geeky conversation to use that term. Um, however, um, I think it's important. And, and interestingly, this is really something I was introduced to um, many years ago, probably 15 years ago, I met Mr. Ian Gordon of the Longwave Group. He is now retired. And he's the first person that introduced me to this idea of economic seasons. And it was an important connect the dots moments for me. It, it kind of helped me understand why financial markets were doing what they did and where they were likely going to go. Now, predicting economic seasons is kind of like predicting the weather. I mean, we know that summer weather will eventually follow spring weather, but here in Michigan, where I live, we had a very cold, wet spring, and some of us wondered if spring uh, would ever get here. So economic seasons work a lot the same way. We, we can't necessarily uh, predict the precise point at which we move from a spring season economically to a summer season, uh, but we do know that we will move there based on what's going on. So the economic seasons, we're going to name after the seasons of the year, spring, summer, autumn, and winter. And like the four seasons of each year, each economic season also has its own characteristics. Now, for those of you that have read the New Retirement Rules book, these economic season definitions will look familiar. We start with the spring economic season. And during this economic season, an economy experiences a gradual increase in business and employment. Consumer confidence gradually increases. Consumer prices begin a gradual increase compared to the level seen during the previous winter cycle. Stock prices rise and reach a peak at the end of the spring cycle. Uh, credit gradually expands. That means that banks are starting to loan money again, but gradually and conservatively. Um, at the beginning of the spring cycle, overall debt levels are low. Then we move to summer. And during summer, an economy sees an increase in the currency supply, which leads to inflation. Gold prices reach a significant peak at the end of the summer period. Interest rates rise rapidly. Uh, they peak at the end of the summer season. Stocks are under pressure and decline through the period, and they reach a low at the end of the summer cycle. Then the autumn economic season. And during autumn, money is plentiful. Gold prices fall. They reach a low uh, at the end of the autumn season. At the same time, stocks are booming. There's a lesson here in that gold and stocks typically move in opposite directions. They move inversely. The autumn season, we see financial fraud. We see real estate prices going up because of speculation. We see astronomical debt levels and consumer confidence is high because stock prices are up, real estate prices are up and everybody's working. 
Then we go to winter. During winter, an economy experiences a crippling credit crisis. Money becomes scarce. Financial institutions are in trouble since bank has banks have debt as assets. When when debt goes unpaid, it means that banks lose assets. There are unprecedented bankruptcies at the personal, corporate, and government levels. There's a monetary crisis. We're seeing that now. And the economist who first discovered these economic cycles was Nikolai Kondratiev. He wrote a book in 1925 titled The Major Economic Cycles. Now, if you take a look at U.S. history, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this, you see that these cycles have existed. In fact, Ian Gordon from the Long Wave Group uh, has published when the spring, summer, and autumn winter seasons have existed in U.S. history. Now, admittedly, the chart's a little bit dated. Um, he guessed that the winter season would last from 2000 to 2020. Um, it's actually going to extend longer than that for reasons that I will outline here. But if you look back at the last winter season, oops, and I need to go back one here. If you go back to the last winter season, from 1929 to 1949, that period of time was the Great Depression, it, it, and it encompassed also uh, World War II. Now, why did the depression occur? Well, the depression occurred because the debt levels were unsustainable. That's why depressions uh, always occur. And during a winter economic season or a depression, debt has to be purged from the system. You've got to get rid of the debt. There's only two ways to get rid of debt. You pay it down by making principal and interest payments, or you default on it by walking away from the responsibility to pay the debt. Now, I've dug into this a bit deeper, and I believe these economic seasons are directly related to the money currency cycle. And that's what I want to talk about on today's webinar, because hopefully it'll give you a good perspective and I hope an accurate perspective as to what's going on around the world today. So, We've just looked at the four economic seasons. Now I wanna look at the four stages of the money and currency cycle. So stage one of this money currency cycle, we have money and currency being the same thing. So I describe currency as the exchange medium used in commerce. And I define money as a good store of wealth over time. Now the Federal Reserve was set up in 1913 and prior to that time, gold circulated as currency. A one ounce gold coin was a $20 gold piece. And that's what you used if you were gonna buy something. That's what you would get if you were going to sell something. So the gold piece was currency. It was used in commerce. It was the exchange medium. But the gold piece was also money. And money again is defined as a good store of wealth over time. Well, the one ounce gold coin had $20 in purchasing power in 1913. Today, that very same gold piece has more than $2,000 in purchasing power. Then we go to stage two of this money currency cycle where we have paper receipts that circulate as currency, but these paper receipts can be redeemed for the real money, the precious metal. Shortly after the Federal Reserve was formed, there were $20 Federal Reserve notes that circulated and you could take these Federal Reserve notes and you could use them as a claim check for the one ounce gold coins. On this Federal Reserve note was the verbiage, will pay to the bearer on demand $20. So the holder of that note, if you had one of these Federal Reserve notes that said payable, will pay to the bearer on demand $20, you could take it to the bank and get $20, the real money, which was an ounce of gold. Now in stage three, these paper receipts no longer have a link to gold or precious metals. That makes the currency a fiat currency. And you've all heard this term, a fiat currency like the US dollar, it's backed by the full faith and credit of the issuer or the US government. Now history teaches us that once a currency becomes a fiat currency, it's only a matter of time before the ruling class overspends and then funds that overspending through currency creation. An excessive currency creation leads to inflation and then sometimes, ultimately, a currency failure. Once the fiat currency fails or confidence is lost in the fiat currency, the money currency cycle goes back to the first stage and currency and money become the same thing again. Now, 
just like economic cycles, the stages in the money currency cycle can't be precisely defined. There's transition periods as you move from one stage to the other. In other words, uh, there's some gray areas where maybe you've got some characteristics of one stage and some characteristics of another stage of this money currency cycle existing at exactly the same time. Now, here's what's interesting. When you look at the winter seasons in U.S. history, winter seasons were deep recessions or depression. You find that the stage of the money currency cycle was the same every time preceding a winter season. So it's really instructive if you want to know what to do with your money to look at each of these winter seasons and the money and the currency that was being used at the time. Now, if you begin with a winter season that began in 1837, we're more familiar with the winter season that began in 1929. The stock market crashed, but the winter season that began in 1837 was catalyzed by the panic of 1837 it looked a lot like the stock market crash of 1939. Now, prior to that winter season of 1837, that depression, we had easy money policies because after the war of 1812, there was a lot of debt and the politicians of the day very predictably set up a central bank that could print paper currency and it had a loose link, this paper currency to precious metals. Now, in stage two of the money currency cycle, like we talked about, we have paper currency that's redeemable for the precious metal that backs the currency. Now, uh, there have been times historically that you don't go straight from stage two of the money currency cycle to stage three. And again, stage three is when the money, when the currency becomes a fiat currency. There's been a lot of times throughout history that policymakers have just reduced the backing of the paper currency without eliminating the link. So you can weaken the currency by loosening the link or by, by uh, making the link between uh, the currency that circulates and the precious metals that back it weaker. In other words, you don't have as much real precious metals backing the circulating currency. So that's what happened back after the War of 1812. This bank that could print paper currency, the second national bank, was set up and it opened for business in January of 1817. Immediately, the bank began to issue paper notes that could be redeemed for precious metals. As typically happens when this stage two of the money currency cycle is adulterated, the bank issued more paper currency than it had precious metals to back. And what happened then was the currency supply increased. We had easy money. So this was the early 1800s version of today's quantitative easing. The difference is today the US dollar is a pure fiat currency. In the early 1800s, the currency supply was increased by weakening the strength of the currency. In other words, it was backed by less precious metals. Now, it was inevitable that the currency supply would lead to a price bubble. When, when the currency supply expands, that money has to go somewhere, that currency has to go somewhere, and you typically get a price bubble. And I'm going to give you just a quick excerpt from an article that described the economy during the 1830s prior to the Panic of 1837, which was when the crash set in. After the demise of the Bank of the United States, State wildcat banks grew rapidly during the 1830s. Funds were more easily available and investors borrowed money at an incredible pace. Not only the Western farmer, but merchants, manufacturers, and traders also borrowed heavily. The business community didn't pay off their debts. Instead, they went out and borrowed more because they anticipated they would get better returns if they invested the borrowed money in speculative enterprises. Land went nuts. Land offices throughout the country reported uh, record sales. Uh, by 1836, sales were 10 times greater than they were in 1830. It was a period of speculative mania that the government couldn't stop. And that all ended, of course, with the Panic of 1837. The, bank, uh, the, the banks failed in 1837. Stock prices collapsed. Real estate prices fell. 
that's what happened when the system that's what happens when the system reaches its capacity for debt so the country said whoops we made a mistake there they went back to a system of money that was more sound but it all happened again about 40 years later when president lincoln and congress changed the banking rules to fund the civil war these rule changes allowed the u.s dollar to be backed by not only gold and silver but also u.s government debt prior to these changes dollars were only backed by gold and silver but now they could be backed by gold silver and u.s government debt and again there was a huge increase in the currency supply which allowed the war to be funded but predictably bubbles formed in stocks and real estate and again there's an excerpt from an article um that we will talk about here oops i got to go back one so the long depression of 1873 set in the country returned i thought there was an excerpt there i apologize uh after the bubble burst the country went back to a currency system that was more sound and gold and silver once again were used as currency that changed in 1913. that's when the federal reserve was founded the Fed reduced the backing of the U.S. dollar by gold from 100% backed by gold to only 40% backed by gold, and the currency supply increased. The Roaring Twenties followed. That was very predictable. Stock prices uh, went extremely high. Margin requirements were very loose. You could have just 10% equity in your account. Real estate prices went nuts. The state of Florida was where the real estate market was in um, a high boom stage. Uh, here's an article that describes it. The famous stock market bubble of 1925 to 1929 has been closely analyzed. Less well known and far less well documented is the nationwide real estate bubble that began around 1921 and deflated around 1926. Florida was the site of real estate bubbles. This is a terrific description. Contemporary accounts describe a collective madness that consumed Florida investors. City lots in Miami were bought and sold as many as 10 times in a single day. The housing market turned down in 1926. Foreclosures peaked in 1933 after the stock market crashed. Now, here's the point. In each of these historical U.S.-based winter economic seasons, easy money allowed for the building of debt bubbles that eventually collapsed. Now, it's also important to point out, and this is the, the, the really important point of today's Headline Roundup webinar. In each of these historical examples, prior to the Panic of 1837, prior to the Long Depression of 1873, and prior to the Great Depression, there was an expansion of the currency supply, but the US dollar was still linked to gold to some extent. Now, that brings us to where we now find ourselves. There's been no link, as you all know, between the U.S. dollar and a precious metal since 1971. The U.S. dollar has been a fiat currency for more than 50 years. That has allowed debt levels in the private sector and public sector to soar. And this skewing, if you will, has also uh, changed the way that we are looking at economic data. And by the way, there is, I should point out, Mark, and I, we, we were both remiss at the beginning of today's webinar, uh, there is a chat box on the right-hand control panel. So I am monitoring that. If you guys have any questions at all, uh, you go ahead and just type your question or message in, and I will be monitoring that as we go through the material also. So again, uh, my apologies for not bringing that up earlier. Give us a, a little bit of slack, please, our first week with a new system here. So again, there is a chat box on the right-hand side if you have a question or comment. So as I said, this devaluing of the currency has changed the way that we look at economic data. Since the financial crisis of about a dozen years ago now, in addition to creating money by creating currency by loaning it into existence, for about a dozen years, the Fed has been engaging in quantitative easing, which is a very academic way of saying that they're creating currency out of thin air. 
this currency creation meaningfully changes the way we look at economic data, including investing markets, and we'll look at stocks here as an example. This is a chart that I just put together on uh, after market close on Friday. It's a monthly chart of the S&P 500 index. Now, if you'll notice on this chart, I've drawn two horizontal lines on the chart. One toward the bottom of the chart that represents the market peak in 2007, and one across the top of the chart, also horizontal, uh, that represents the current value of the S&P 500. Now, the horizontal line drawn across the market top in 2007 had the S&P 500 at about 1560. Presently, uh, the S&P 500 is at 4270. So, nominally speaking, the stock rallied from 1560 to 4270 over that time frame. That's an increase of 273%. But did the stock market really rally that strongly? Or, better question, did the US dollar devalue that much? Well, one of the best ways to make this calculation is to go back and price stocks in gold. Well, in 2007, an ounce of gold sold for a little under $700 an ounce. So we'll just take 700. So let's take the value of the S&P 500 in 2007 of 1560. Let's divide by 700 and we get a number of 2.2. So if you put that another way, it took 2.2 ounces of gold to buy the S&P 500 in 2007. Now today, the spot price of gold is about 1950 per ounce and the S&P 500 stands at 4270. Let's do the same math, 4270 divided by 1950, and we get a factor of just under 2.2. It takes a little less gold to buy the S&P 500 today than at the time of the financial crisis. So this means that in nominal terms, the stock market went higher, but in real terms, it did not. In real terms, the market is about flat. Nominally, the stock market is higher, but that's simply because the dollar has been devalued to that great extent. So the point is this, prior economic winter seasons, the US dollar was devalued, but not even close to where it has been devalued to today. Currency creation in the past amounted to changing the relationship between the US dollar and gold. Today, there is no relationship between the US dollar and gold other than you can take US dollars and buy gold at whatever the market price happens to be. So currency creation today is done with no link to anything tangible, which means there's no restraint mechanism. Bubbles now have inflated to, to levels never before possible, even greater than what we saw in the prior bubbles we just looked at. The Fed's response to any economic issues faced over the past 15 years has been to create currency, and we're now seeing inflation as a result. Now, when you look at periods of time when there is no link, there's no relationship between a currency and gold, you get some insight as to where we might be headed. When you see that there is no link between paper currency and precious metals, you can get a highly inflationary outcome when measured in terms of the paper currency, but when measured in metals, the outcome will be deflationary. And I've got an example here from Weimar, Germany, which is probably the most infamous to use that term example. Measured in German mar marks, Germany experienced a hyperinflation, but measured in terms of gold, Germany experienced deflation as gold priced in marks gained 300% in purchasing power while inflation raged. So where we go now will be entirely dependent, in my view, on the policy of the Federal Reserve. We will not avoid deflation because of all the debt that exists. Should the Fed continue to tighten in a meaningful way, it will likely, likely trigger the deflationary collapse in asset prices. And we saw that last week, perhaps, uh, already as it relates to stocks. And again, I'm nearing the end of the material today, so if you have a question, uh, or comment, there is a chat box on the right-hand side that I'll be monitoring. So this is the outcome that I now see. U.S. Treasuries will likely go lower 
stock prices will drop and precious metals, nominally speaking, priced in dollars will rise. The Fed is looking to engineer a soft landing. Jerome Powell stated that was his objective, although he did say it's imperative that we restore, restore rather price stability. I don't think we'll see that outcome for stocks and bonds. I don't think that's going to be possible. Joe Carson, who's a commentator, discussed stocks, putting it this way. He said, how vulnerable is the equity market? It's very susceptible. The cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio is running twice as high as the historical average. Meanwhile, the Fed is in the early stages of raising official rates and draining liquidity, which has proven to be the death knell for the equity market. That was the case in 2018. I believe that will be the case again now. The long-term cyclically adjusted price earnings average is 16 to 17. However, we are now about twice that. So stocks are very overvalued. We've often discussed the Buffett indicator, which measures stock valuations by taking total market capitalization and dividing by uh, economic output. By that measure, they are also extremely overvalued. Carson says policymakers are now in a jam and so are equity or stock investors. Never before has the Fed started to raise official rates when the Fed funds rates stood 800 basis points below the current inflation rate. The new promise by the Fed is to get back to a neutral policy. We've discussed this in the past. You don't, get, you don't cure inflation until interest rates are higher than the real inflation rate. Eight and a half percent is the official inflation rate. We all know the real inflation rate is much higher than the consumer price index, which has been a, a, a highly altered number over the years. In the late 1990s, Carson said policymakers raised 175 basis points, 1.75 percent. And what happened? Well, it triggered the tech stock bubble collapse. It triggered the Panic of 1837, the Long Depression of 1873, and the Great Depression in 1929. We now have the cyclically adjusted price earnings ratio running at near record highs, and equity investors are at risk, according to Carson, without a change in Fed policy. But if you add an interest rate increase to this, um, even if the Fed figures out how to engineer a soft landing for the economy, which I don't believe is possible. Carson says a hard landing appears in store for the equity market. James Bullard, who's president of the St. Louis Federal Reserve, said this for, about U.S. Treasuries. He said, the bond market is now looking like a very safe place to be. Here's a guy who's helping to set monetary policy, and he says it doesn't look like a very safe place to be. So I believe that we may indeed be at the beginning of a period of time when asset prices reset. Uh, that's why we believe that you should have hedged positions in stocks. You should focus on only sectors that are doing well. Um, and as I've said before, I don't think the Fed can get inflation under control. In the report, I said, paint me skeptical. The Fed cannot tighten to the point that it needs to unless the Washington politicians balance the federal budget or at least get it closer to balanced. The Fed is the largest holder of U.S. government debt in the world. Without the Fed's indirect purchases of U.S. government debt from member banks, the deficit spending of the federal government can't be financed. So here's what I expect. Talk, but probably not meaningful action. Uh, the Fed likely, uh, can't raise interest rates enough to adequate, adequately address accelerating inflation, and it'll likely mean more, more downside for stocks and more upside for tangible assets like gold and silver in particular. So that's the material that I wanted to cover today. I'm not seeing any comments in the chat box. There is However, one question, I, Dennis, from Jeff. Okay, I am... Uh, Gonna need some help finding that, so please okay. repeat that, it's, Mark. There's a there's a tab called questions right above chat, which is where the questions cool. end up now instead of in the chat box. So call that a rookie at the at the wheel here. So uh, that's why don't okay. You go ahead and just re, read Jeff's question for me, if you would, please. Sure, no problem. So the question is: I read somewhere that the 
BRICS nations have been developing their own version of the SWIFT system for processing electronic transactions. In your view, how much more quickly could that, plus the move by the Saudis to consider taking currencies other than the US dollar for payment for oil, thus potentially ending the petrodollar system, ultimately bring an end to the dollar as a world reserve currency? I'm sorry, Mark, could you repeat that? No, I'm just kidding. I heard, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> you and just did such a nice job his, reading it. And his follow-up um, question was, wouldn't a recession also dampen inflationary pressures? Well, yeah, let's start with the second one first. I mean, there's two ways to cure inflation. One is you raise interest rates to the point that um, you, you uh, reduce the currency supply through deflation. Uh, the other thing, another way to cure inflation is to have a big market crash and recession because that takes a lot of wealth out of the economy. So for sure, I think this recession is going to be unavoidable. Um, it was unavoidable in 2009. Um, that's why the Fed started to create currency out of thin air through their quantitative easing program. And it has been a more than a decade of kicking the can down the road. Now, I uh, last week on the uh, headline roundup webinar talked about uh, a Russian economist by the name, and I'm going from memory here, but I believe it's Sergei Glazchev. And Mr. Glazchev uh, came out and openly said that the uh, Eurasian nations, uh, you know, and Russia, uh, Kazakhstan, uh, a number of other nations, and China are openly pursuing a system that would bypass the US dollar. And while certainly, um, I don't want to comment on, you know, the, the the politics behind what's going on geopolitically at this point, but you know that's an interesting discussion as well. But when you take a look at uh, the sanctions that were imposed on Russia, really eliminated any access that Russia has to U.S. dollars. In fact, Russian reserves, denominated in dollars, were frozen. You might say seized uh, in in other countries. That had never happened before, even during wartime. So it was a very big move. And from the, the perspective of keeping the US dollar healthy, I believe that it was a, a, a move that should not have been made, that wasn't thought through because now Russia is demanding gold or rubles for any countries that want to buy its natural resources. Well, that may not affect the United States directly, but it certainly affects Europe. Because Europe, uh, many countries in Europe, I believe it's 13 countries, get 65 to 100 percent of their energy from Russia, and they now have to have gold or rubles to buy that energy. So uh, I believe that this this coalition that are imposing sanctions on Russia uh, will likely weaken because uh, the, the, the citizens of Europe are going to want to stay warm this winter. Uh, so I, I think that uh, that's going to be very difficult. The other thing it did is force Russia. Uh, to abandon the U.S. dollar. Now, I reported a few months ago that the Russian Central Bank uh, had more gold than U.S. dollars as reserves. Um, that, that I believe, is, you know, that might even be five or six months ago, and I'd have to go back and research it. But we've been moving in this direction for a while. So I believe, Jeff, uh, yes, uh, the, the BRICS countries are openly discussing that they're going to move uh, away from the dollar. And Mr. Glazchev uh, said, and you can go back and watch in the last week's uh, uh, headline roundup webinar uh, because the article's in there. He said there's three stages to this, to this transition. And the first stage, moving away from dollars, is, is at this point over. So, yeah, I think you're going to see uh, the dollar's dominance take a hit. I don't think that the dollar loses reserve status overnight, but let's just say that the process has begun. And historically speaking, uh, you know, currencies always um, evolve and reserve currencies are replaced. I mean, prior to the dollar, it was the British pound sterling. And uh, you can go back and I had that in last week's webinar as well. So, yeah, I think that you're, you're going to see this move uh, accelerate. I think that it's going to uh, uh, mean that these Countries that were inventorying U.S. dollars to trade now don't need them, and I think that adds to our inflation here. It's just common sense that uh, those dollars are going to come back here, and as these countries that inventory U.S. dollars and U.S. treasuries, as those U.S. treasuries mature, 
they're not going to repurchase them. And that's why you're seeing the bond market doing what it's doing, in my opinion. Uh, U.S. Treasuries are down significantly uh, and interest rates are up significantly. So that's a kind of a long-winded answer, Jeff, but hopefully that's helpful. That, that's how I see it. Jeff added one further comment. The Russians, I believe, now have a 20% backing of gold. Yeah, they've, they've tied the ruble to a gold peg that'll be a moving gold peg that I think will next be adjusted in July. So yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're kind of at that, it, it's, a, it's a loose version of stage two of that, of the currency, of the money currency cycle. And we definitely have been uh, in a winter season that has been masked by all this currency creation. Now, I believe when we move back to a stage one or stage two of the money currency cycle that we're going to see uh, the, the, the winter uh, season symptoms kick in in earnest. So, yeah, Jeff, I, I'm not sure. I wasn't familiar with the 20 percent number, but there's certainly a peg there. That, that, that is the case. So uh, great comments, as usual, from Jeff. Um, Mark, uh, am I missing any other questions? Uh, that is it for now. I think we, I think we've got them all. Guys, we will be, uh, going back and, uh, oops, I will quit sharing my screen here. We will go back and we will, uh, be back again next week. Uh, let us know what you thought of the new platform. Uh, we were a little clunky today, but we will get better. Uh, thank you. Had a good turnout again. So, uh, we will, uh, Talk to you again next week. Have a good week.